Hey, Liquid Church, Pastor Tim here. I'm so glad you joined us this Sunday. My family and I are actually on vacation down the shore. We're at the beach this weekend, and I look forward to being back with you soon. But you're in for a treat because I invited my new friend, Lori Short, to join us at Liquid today. Lori is a national speaker and the author of the book titled Finding Faith in the Dark, When the Story of Your Life Takes a Turn You Didn't Plan. Have you ever had life throw you a curveball? Something you didn't expect happen, uh, hits you kind of broadside, or maybe something you're anticipating happening never actually happened and life seems stuck or stalled. Where is God when life doesn't make sense? I know today you are gonna be encouraged because Lori is gonna take the story of God in scripture, connect it to her own life story, which is very compelling, and hopefully help you to see how God is actually writing and editing your story even when you can't see his hand at work. You're gonna enjoy Lori, she's a fantastic speaker. In fact, as a national speaker, she has now spoken to over a half million people in her 25 years of ministry. She serves as a pastor on staff at Ocean Hills Church in Santa Barbara, California. So we are super blessed to have her. I hope you'll join me in giving a huge, warm, liquid welcome to our new friend, Pastor Lori Short. Well, it is so great to be here at Liquid Church. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, as has already been introduced, my name is Lori, and I'm thrilled to be here out from California, Levin, New Jersey. Um, I found a slide on the internet, actually a picture that I made into a slide that I think maybe represents a few of us in this room. So I'm gonna have them put it up right now and see if you can possibly relate to this picture. You know, we have our plans, right? We, we sort of present them to God, and I've always heard the saying, you know, if you want to make lo God laugh, show him your plans. And I think if you are over the age of 20 this morning, and even sometimes under that, you have probably experienced a time where you're not exactly living a season that you had planned to live. Some of you may be here today, in a season that not only you didn't plan to live, but frankly, you would prefer not to live. Maybe some of you are not in that season, you're in a great season today, but you have been there before. And probably all of us can say that at some point we're gonna be there in a place where maybe we just wouldn't have chosen to be there. And that is when I think we come to a crossroads in our faith. And that's what we're going to talk about here this morning at Liquid. So I'm going to take you to a scripture. It's in John 21. John is the fourth gospel in the New Testament. And you are welcome to follow along with your Bibles. I think we're going to have some scripture up on the screen as well. Um, and, I, and it's really my prayer this morning that God speaks to you. Just the word that you need, the word of encouragement you need, wherever you are in your story. Because we have a personal God. And he knows every one of your stories. Even though I don't, he knows what brings you here today. And my prayer is that he'll just turn up the volume on the, on the words that you need to hear for your story. That's the mystery of God's word. So in John 21, let me give you a little bit of context to the passage that I'm going to refer to. It begins in verse 15. And Jesus is now resurrected from the dead, praise God, and he had just gone to the cross. And as you remember, just before he went to the cross, he told Peter that he was going to deny him three times. Now, Peter was one of his closest friends, his closest disciples. And so, of course, Peter responded the way most of us respond when we feel so close to God. Oh, God, even if everybody else denies you, and this is what Peter said to Jesus, even if everybody else denies you, Jesus, I will never deny you. Well, within 24 hours from that moment, Peter was denying him three times. And, of course, many of you know that story. And so Peter never got a chance to see Jesus again before he went to the cross and died. And, of course, he, along with all the other disciples, all the other followers, were confused at that moment because here was this person they were following, and they thought he was going to be a king, and now he's dead on a cross. But three days later, he rose from the dead, and he began to appear to people and the, the place that I want to take you in Scripture is when he has one personal encounter with Peter. And it's such a beautiful encounter because what he does, starting in verse 15, is he asks Peter three times if he loves him. And, of course, he calls him by his birth name. He calls him Simon. And so if you are looking along at the passage, and I think we're going to have it up on the screen, 
This, this is what it says. Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And some scholars think he's referring to maybe the fish that are around uh, Peter at that moment because he had gone back to fishing. Do you love me more than your vocation? Do you love me more than these? And, uh, and he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Once again, feed my sheep. And then a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. Three times Peter had denied Jesus. And three times Jesus gives Peter a redo. And isn't that just like God in our lives? That he always is there to give us grace when we come back to him. And that's what Peter was doing. And so Jesus has this beautiful encounter with Peter. And then we get to a verse in the Bible that I have to tell you is one of my least favorite verses. Can I just confess that that's this morning? How many of you have verses in your Bibles that you would actually prefer to white out if you were given the choice? Yes, I think some of us have those verses where we get to them and we go, wow, this is really convicting, Lord. But this verse, I think, shows us that sometimes life is not going to go the way we want it to. Here's what Jesus says. He says, Peter, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And we know that that's what happened to Peter. But I have a question for you here this morning. I wonder how many of you have been where you do not want to go. Maybe some of you are sitting here this morning, and you're where you would not like to be. I can tell you that for me, and this is just my story, but it was extended singleness in my life. I was not the ring by spring gal in college. I recognize because I speak at college campuses that that is the goal for some girls that are there on campus. By senior year, I'm going to have a ring on my finger because after all, I'm going to be 21, and after 21, nothing much can happen in my life. That's about when it's, you know, that's my last chance. I try to tell them that they probably have a little bit of life after that, but, you know, that's their goal. Well, I wasn't really a ring by spring gal, but I thought about 25. That was my script for God. That's the one I presented to him. Thank you very much. I said, you know, about 25, I'd love him to come into my life, have my 2.5 kids, and it'll be awesome. And 25 came and went, and then I hit 30, and now I'm starting to pray a little bit harder. Some of you have had those prayer requests that have gone on, and I'm actually, I'm starting to speak, so I'm, I'm starting to recruit some other people in this endeavor. So now, you know, please God have mercy and bring this girl a husband, became people's prayers. And then 30 came and went, and 35 came and went, and then I hit 40, and I began to suspect that God was deaf. I don't know if any of you have had a prayer that you've prayed so long that you start to wonder, is is God even listening to me? Well, finally, at 42 years old, I got engaged. And I have to tell you, the hallelujah chorus broke out in my household. My dad was like, thank you, Jesus. And he doesn't even pray that way. I mean, it was just... Thank you. It's finally happened. And I, you know, of course, celebrated, and I had two bridal showers, and, and I, I bought my wedding dress, the most beautiful dress you've ever seen. And then just a couple of months short of my wedding, my fiancé got deployed. And, uh, and he was going to be gone for nine months. And so I thought, well, gosh, Lord, I've waited this long. I can wait this much longer, you know, and so we had already bought furniture that was going to be in our home, so I was going to keep the house while he was away, and, and so he went away, and in the course of his deployment, unbeknownst to me, his ex-wife actually began communicating with him about how she was having second thoughts about the divorce, and so when he came back after nine months, I am now 43 years old, and he comes back, and we broke up, and he remarried his ex-wife which is actually a great story when you're not the girl engaged to the guy (laughs) who goes back to the ex-wife. 
And I have to tell you, there were some well-meaning people that said to me, well, isn't it great that God used you to get them back together? (laughs) I'm like, you know what? It's awesome, and I hope you have the same experience someday. (laughs) You know, Christians can say the darndest things, which is why I'd like to just encourage you, Liquid Church, if you have a friend that's going through a hard time, listening is good. Before you start slapping what God is doing in your situation, just remember that that person may be struggling. And I have to tell you, I am the product of a divorce. My parents got divorced, and I would have loved my parents to get back together. So it was a great story, but I felt like God was being mean to me. And I wonder how many of you have felt that way. For me, it was such a tender area. I couldn't understand why God would give it to me and then take it away. And it was a very confusing, difficult time in my life. And it was, frankly, a crossroads in my faith. And I felt like Peter a little bit because I had already been following Christ so long, and I was now speaking all over the place and and sharing about all the great things that he has done. And And now I felt like I can't share my testimony. People are going to walk away from God if I share my testimony. The mysterious thing that that I discovered about God is it's actually in the middle of the story when you have your most powerful testimony. When you are hanging on to God and he maybe isn't doing what you want him to do and you are proclaiming your faith, I don't think your testimony is ever more powerful than it is at that moment. And God whispered that to me. You just tell your story. I'm God. I'm big enough for this story. And I did because I was speaking at the time. And I hung on to God. And, and I, I learned some things in my suffering. And I think we can find some things in this passage that really can minister to you when you or someone you love is walking through a difficult season. And so as we look at the passage a little bit deeper, the first thing that I want to uh, share with you is... Um, is actually a psalm that I think goes with this passage. And it's a tiny little psalm, just three verses. And I actually asked them to put it up on the screen because I want to show you this psalm because I didn't even know the psalm until somebody showed it to me when I was going through a difficult time. David writes this psalm, three verses, and he says this, My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. Clearly he's going through a difficult season. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. He's saying, you know what? I know that I don't get everything that's happening right now. But listen to this. He says, but I have stilled and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Isn't that mysterious that David would call his soul a weaned child? I wonder how many of you, how many of you moms out there had the experience of weaning a child? Could I see your hand? Okay, a few of you. Now, a lot of you didn't raise your hands. Maybe you're male, and that's good that you didn't raise your hands. But, or you're single, or you just never had that opportunity to do that. But now I have another question. How many of you have had the experience of being weaned? Now, this is when all of you need to raise your hand. I'm hoping, because (laughs) I have never witnessed an adult breastfeeding, and thank you, Jesus, for that. Um, So the fact is, every one of us, and here's what I want you to hear, every one of us has had the experience of being withheld from something we wanted by someone who loved us for the sake of our growth. Now, no one's ever going to love you more than your mom. And at some point, you had the experience, and you probably had it throughout your childhood, of your parents withholding something you wanted, and they were somebody who loved you for the sake of your growth. And I believe that what David is saying in this passage, in this little psalm, and it's kind of what Peter experiences here, is that when we go where we do not want to go, when we have an experience of God not doing what we want him to do, of not answering our prayer the way we want him to, is that we have an opportunity to grow up in our faith. Because, see, God doesn't just want to be Santa Claus God. And that's who he is, right? When we first get to know him, it's so awesome because he answers all of our prayers. Oh, God, give me a parking place as I come here to Liquid Church. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, all of our little prayers. 
And, and we just see God working all over the place. And then there comes a day in all of our journeys. Then there comes a day where we pray a prayer that's not answered the way we want it to. And the question is, will you, will you continue to follow God so that God can move from being Santa Claus God to the living God? Because that's who he wants to be in your life. See, when we first become a Christian, we are sitting in the driver's seat, and we invite Jesus to come along with us and sit in the passenger seat to bless our plan as we go. God, you are so good. I just want you to bless the plan I have. And there comes a certain time in all of our journeys where Jesus wants you to stop the car, and then he gets out of the car, and he wants to trade places with you. He wants to take the driver's seat. Because he, God, has plans for us that we don't have for ourselves, and they're so much bigger than us. And he wants to know if we're willing to go with him to take that next step of faith. Well, the second thing we see in this passage is what Peter does as soon as he gets this news. He gets this news that he's going to be led where he doesn't want to go. And then John walks by. I love this part of the passage because this is so me, and I'm sure it's you too. John walks by, and Peter looks at him and goes, but Lord, what about him? Don't we do that? When we're going through a difficult time, the first thing we do is we start looking around at everybody else. What about her? What about him? I'm single. Why is she married? Look at her husband. Look at her kids. And maybe you come here to church today, and if you are single, you're looking at the families, and they look so perfect, don't they? And you only see a soundbite of their life, and you're like, oh my gosh, look at them. And all the married people are looking at the single people and going, oh my gosh, look at them. I mean, you know what? We all look at each other and we just create sound bites in each other's lives because we only know our own story. And I have to tell you guys, social media is the worst when it comes to this. I mean, Facebook and Instagram, and so you're looking at all these pictures and you're creating their lives. You're like, why isn't my life like that? Can we just say this morning that everybody is cuter, thinner, has a better looking spouse, and more well-behaved children on Facebook than they do in real life? Can we just say that this morning? Amen. And the reason I know that is because you do too. See, we all, none of us post unflattering pictures of ourselves. Oh, no, no, no. We take 20 pictures of the same thing, and then we comb through them, pick the best one, post it up, and go, this is my life. And then we're looking at each other's pictures and creating this life and living our own life, and we're like, Lord, what about him? Well, Jesus has a word for Peter at that moment. He says, Peter, if I want John to remain alive till I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. You must follow me. In other words, Peter, you must live your story. You're not living John's story. John's living John's story. You're living your story, and that's the story I've written for you. And so as we look at this and we think about this, what is that story? When we're living a season we don't want to live, we don't really want to live our story. And God's saying, if I am the great I am, I know where you are right now, and I have a plan for you right now, even if you're where you do not want to be. And certainly I discovered that in my single years because I was praying, God, I want to be a wife. God, I want to be a mom. And you know, eventually God said to me, Lori, do you really want to be a mom? Because if you're not hung up on the biology part, you can be a mom. I mean, I've got children all over the world who need a mom. Are you willing to step up and be a mom, even if it's not happening in the package that you want it to happen? And I have to tell you, it was tempting all those years to just to just sort of sit on the couch and wait for the guy to show up with the rose, you know, being the bachelorette. No, God wanted me to live my life. And yes, it felt like living without a leg. I'll just be honest, because I never felt the call to singleness. And yes, people would say to me, you know, it's when you stop wanting it, that's when God will bring it. Don't you love it when people say that? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna fool God. Okay, I don't want it, I don't want it. <laughs> come on, Lord, you know, I mean, it's like, come on, no. 
I never say that to people. Just give God your desire every day. Even if it's 20, 30 years, God knows no time. He's outside of our time. You give God your desire and then live your life because that's what God is saying. Okay, you know what? I have a plan for that desire. You can't see it right now. That's what faith is about, but I want you to live where you are right now. And so I began, and I was involved for many years in youth ministry. I was a youth pastor, and so I ministered to kids, and I especially had a heart for those kids whose parents were kind of out of sorts. One girl in particular I worked with whose mom was a drug addict, and so I kind of came alongside of her, and uh, she was part of my youth group, and um, still to this day she calls me mom. She's so dear. And, and then I stopped being a youth pastor. I was in Berkeley at the time, and I, I moved back down to Southern California, and I started teaching part-time at Azusa Pacific University and speaking, and, and, I, and I was going to volunteer again in a youth ministry, but God just began stirring my heart about kids in the inner city because I had been there on weekends and, and, and taken kids down there for mission trips, but... I just felt like I could do more. I mean, I didn't have a family, so I had this time. So once a week, I began driving to, to Los Angeles, downtown Skid Row. And I started working with a church called Central City Community Church. And they ran an after-school program called Say Yes, Save America's Youth, yes. And so I, I basically just gave myself as a volunteer. I said, I'll just come here in the afternoons and work with the kids as they're doing their homework. And these were kids that were raised um, on the streets. Some of them lived in hotel rooms. And these are not like hotel rooms like you and I think of hotels. I mean, some of you have been in inner city hotels. People rent the rooms by the month. And there was one girl in the program as I started working with the kids. She was 11 years old. And she just had this beautiful smile, so bright. But I noticed she was kind of neglected. She wore the same things uh, all the time, and she kind of started to smell. And so I, I asked the director of Say Yes, I said, you know, tell me her story. And, and she said, well, it's really sad. You know, she, um, she actually lives with her dad. Her dad's fathered about 20 different kids, all with different women. And she's only met her mom a couple of times. Um, she's on the street. So she ended up living with her dad, which is very unusual in the inner city. And so clearly, we're talking big, huge mother gap here. And the Holy Spirit starts working on me and saying, you know, why don't you, why don't you spend some time with this girl? Now, I don't know what you do when the Holy Spirit starts working with you, but I usually do the very spiritual act of arguing with God about why I can't do that particular thing. And so he always has, I'm pretty stubborn, so he has to work with me. And, and eventually, this, you, know, this, you know what it's like to just feel that pull inside. And I was like... You know, I, what do I have? I can't even, I'm so suburban. She's so, I, you know, and he was like, just love her. Well, I can do that. So I went up to her and asked her if, um, what she would think if we, you know, spent some time together. If I came early that day of say yes and picked her up from school. And of course, she was totally open to that, hungry for that. So I, I remember the first day I got her, I had no idea what I was going to do with her. And um, I'm just praying. And I said, well, why don't you show me where you live? And so, she, of course, had never been out of the inner city. So proudly, we're walking into the Skid Row Hotel, which was filthy. I mean, drugs all over the place, people urinating in the ha hallways. I mean, it was just gross. I mean, places you wouldn't even want your children to be, let alone live. And we're walking through, and she's holding my hand, and, and she, we go into her room, and she shows me, and it just smelled horrible. And there was a, 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 bu a Bunsen burner was their stove, and just, you know, clothes piled in the bathtub, and so I thought, you know, okay, well, maybe we can, hey, why don't we gather your clothes, and we'll, we'll take them to the laundromat. I'll show you, you know, how to wash your clothes, and so we went to the laundromat, and, and went and picked up soap and some other things. You know that verse of becoming the fragrance of Christ took on a whole new meaning for me, so that was my little silly ministry, and uh, just doing what I can, just showing up to do it. And, and God just knit our hearts together. And we began to form this amazing bond. And um, she ended up coming and spending the night with me in Orange County. And, and, uh, and eventually, when she turned about 15 years old, I started noticing that she was putting on a little bit of weight. And so, you know, you never tell a girl, especially, any of that. But after a while, it became apparent that something was going on. And so... 
I, I asked her, I said, sweetie, I'm, I think we better go to the doctor and check out what's going on. And so we went. She was five months pregnant and didn't even know it. That's how disconnected she was from her, her body. I mean, she was raised in an environment where prostitutes were in and out of her living space. I mean, she probably, Lord knows what she was exposed to before I even met her. And so she was pregnant. And the interesting thing is because of our relationship, because she had been outside of Skid Row, because she had spent Thanksgivings and Christmases with my family, she knew life existed outside of where she was. And she decided, even though her dad advised her against it, that she wanted to give her baby up for adoption. And I was so proud of her. So we combed through books, and she finally found a couple. And then three weeks early, she delivered her child. And do you know that I was on the way to the hospital when I got the call that they decided they wanted a girl, and Seneca had a boy. And so... Um, I got there, and she was, like, passed out on the bed. She had just given birth. And this little baby was all by himself in the bassinet in this inner-city hospital. And I walked in the room, and I want to show you a picture of the little child that I saw. And I just prayed over this little child. I just said, God, I know you have a plan. She wanted to give this baby another life than the one she had. And so as I was praying, it was about a week later, the baby went into foster care temporarily, and I knew she was going to take him back if nobody took him. And so I was with my best friend who had four kids in, in Mariner's Christian School, a Christian school, and she knew of this couple that had been trying to have a baby for like seven years. Everybody was praying for them, and they just, they were struggling with infertility. And she goes, I don't even know if they've started thinking about adoption. I was like, well, do you think we should call them? And she goes, why not? So I called him, and I said, would you be willing to meet this girl? Told her the story. They said, we'd love to. So we came and met Tim and Lisa, and you'll see a picture of them on the next screen that with a high five and a yes, my girl decided that this would be the couple. This would be the parents of her, her baby boy. And so they adopted him, and they went through the legal stuff later. And um, you can see that the baby was actually half Mexican, half African American, and Lisa is Puerto Rican, and Tim is Indian black. So this baby looks like a biological child. <laughs> God's biological child for this couple. And, you know, they never could have a baby. And so um, they ended up uh, adopting two others, and all of them came from inner city moms. And so this next picture shows uh, the two kids. Um, Timothy now, that's Seneca's biological child, is on the right. Look how beautiful. And then another boy, and then a third boy. And so the next child shows Timothy growing up. He's um, playing soccer. But this next picture is my favorite because it shows him actually getting the award at, at Mariner's Christian School in fifth grade. He got the award for integrity at his school. And so you would want to talk about a reclaimed life. And, you know, I think about what God saw, what God saw when I was going, God, I want to be a wife. I want to be a mom. And he's going, do you want to be a part of a great story? Because I can make you a part of a great story right now. If you just say yes to your circumstances right now, I can use you wherever you are. Lori, you must follow me. Don't worry about John, Peter. You must follow me. Whatever your story is, you have to live it because you're the only one here who can. And even when you're in a place that you don't want to be, God has a plan for you right there in that part of your story. And you just need to trust him. But I'm here to tell you that if you're here and you're still breathing, your story isn't over. Your story isn't over. And some of you need to hear that right now because you know what? When terrible things happen, we go, it's over. It's done. I just get up in the morning and I just do my thing, but... There's not, God can't possibly do it. Hey, I'm here to tell you that if you got up this morning and you're breathing, check your neighbor, make sure they're breathing. If you're breathing, your story's not through. And would you just turn and proclaim that to the person next to you? Your story isn't over. Just say that to them right now. Your story's not over. And guess what? Neither was mine. And here I was, okay, at 43, now I'm all by myself, back in the apartment I was letting go of, you know, furniture in this home, my, bra my, my wedding dress. I couldn't even deal with it emotionally. I just gave it to my mom. She put it in her closet, stuck a humidifier on it. It was her hope chest. And, and I'm, you know, I'm like, I can't, you know, and I'm alone, and I get this call, random call from this guy, this friend of mine. 
And he was a pastor of a church in Santa Barbara, and he said, Lori Polich, that's my maiden name, and hey, I don't know where you are. I heard you got married. I'm like, no. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, um, hey, we were praying about this new position at our church, and your name came up, and I'm just wondering if you would want to come and check it out. Well, I wasn't looking for a job, but I'm here to tell you something, that if your eyes are fixed on the door that you want to see open, God may be opening another door, and you better pay attention to it, because you have to realize that God may open that door that may open another door that may open another door that you might end up in the same open door you're looking for, but God's routes are not our routes, and his timing is not our timing. And you know what? The thing about God that I've discovered is that when things happen when they're supposed to happen, you know, the timing they're supposed to happen, weddings at 25, we celebrate. But when things happen when they're not supposed to happen, we worship. Because that's what shows the Lord, is that when he can work outside of what we imagine he can do, and so I'm here to tell you, at the ripe young age of 49 years old, this girl became a bride. And, <laughs> but you guys cannot even believe the groom that he delivered to this girl. And I've got a picture of me on my wedding day. This is the man, huh? Come on, ladies. <laughs> Cat calls are welcome. And wait, you got to stay on this picture for a little bit because you will notice that dress on my body. That is the dress that hung in my mother's closet for five years. It was just the wrong groom. It was the right dress. It was the wrong groom. And, and so God had this story for me at a time when I thought he could never, ever do it. And because I would pretty much outaged myself from mothering, unless he was going to pull another Sarah type birth, which I'm open to, but... Not really. Not really. Anyway, <laughs> he actually delivered a package deal. So this next picture shows what came with the groom, which was this beautiful child who was six years old when we married. And because uh, his mother actually moved to Australia to marry somebody else, um, he's with us all but seven weeks out of the year. He calls me mom. This next picture is the three of us. I always say I got two for the price of one because I had to wait so long. And then this next picture shows that he's grown up a little since then. And he is now 13 years old. And, uh, and you know what 13 is like. But we <laughs> love him and we're going to love him through it. And he is such a beautiful answer to prayer. But here's the greatest part of the story is that when I was working with Seneca and we were in this relationship and he had, she had Timothy, at the same time that she had Timothy, just a couple of months apart, another boy was born and his name was Jordan. And I had no idea that this was happening, but that God had this huge story in mind that last summer, my husband and my son and I went to Tim and Lisa's. It was Lisa's 50th birthday party. And we went to see Timothy because we hadn't seen him in so long. And this next picture is me and Jordan and Timothy together. And seeing the two of them together and to know that God's story is so much bigger than ours. And all we have to do is say yes to it. But it is hard because we look at our small story and we say, Lord, I want these things. And you know, it's okay to want those things. It's normal to want those things. But God is asking you, are you willing to trust me? Are you willing to trust me because I have a plan that's bigger than you can see? So your story isn't over. It's never over. You're in the middle of some story right now, but God's asking you, will you live today? I want to close with a little story that I think illustrates so well that when we're in a place we don't want to be, God can still use us right now. And it's actually the story that comes out of World War II. And it was towards the end of the war when Great Britain was bombing Germany every day. And of course, they didn't have the technology we have, so the way they would do it is these planes would take off and they'd be surrounded by their protective planes and they would fly over to German airspace, drop the bomb, and then carefully go back into Great Britain until Germany finally surrendered. Well, one day, a plane took off from Great Britain and went over there, was able to drop the bomb, was headed back, but they 
noticed, they looked out the window and they noticed that somehow they had separated themselves from their protective planes. And then they saw German airplanes coming closer and closer and closer until they were within shooting range of the plane. So literally the pilot like closed his eyes just knowing what was going to happen and five bullets slammed in the fuselage of the plane right in the direction of the gas tank. Well, the pilot's just clinching like this and all of a sudden he realizes nothing has happened. They look over the gas tank and there's gas seeping out of the little holes, but no explosion. There was no explanation. So they carefully re, uh, got control of the plane and they went back, landed the plane, and a mechanic came on board to see what in the world happened. He was able to lodge, uh, dislodge these bullets and he went and looked at them and, and to his surprise, four of the five bullets were empty. There was no gunpowder inside. And in the fifth bullet, there was a crumpled up piece of paper, and it was a note. And I want to read you what the note said. We are Polish POWs forced to make bullets in factory. When guards do not look, we do not fill with powder. It's not much, but it's the best we can do. You know, that's where we all sit. It's not much, but it's the best we can do. Lord, I can't change every inner city girl's life, but I can certainly go and love on one. And I don't know what you're going to do with that because you are a big God and you can do anything. And so I want to challenge you this morning, church. What is the thing that God may be calling you to today? He still has your story in mind. You never give up. You never give up on the things you're asking God to do because his time is not our time. But in the meantime, live your life because there is nobody here who can do that. Only you can live your story. Let's pray. I want to invite you right now that if you're in that place, maybe hurting Maybe things aren't going exactly the way you wish they were, but you are saying, Lord, I am, I am willing. Would you just turn your palms up right there on your lap? Just palms up, just as a sign to say, God, it's hard, and I don't always want to, but I, I know you have me where I am for a reason. And you are a big God, and you see things I can't see, and you are working in ways so far beyond what I know. And you are involved in so many other stories besides my own, and you're asking me to live my life because you want me to touch other people. That's why I'm here. So I pray, Lord, that I'd be open. My, my hands are open right now as a sign for that openness, but God, I need your courage. I need your courage, and I thank you that you are with me that you are Emmanuel, God with us, and you will give me the strength that I need. And so, God, that's my prayer for my brothers and sisters right now, wherever they are, that they would sense your presence and that they would have the courage to live their life. In Jesus' name, amen.